Well, I, I guess it's uh, it's nine thirty two, so I suppose let's let's all get started. Um, we've got a few folks on Zoom again. Uh, most all of you have been here the last couple of weeks have been doing this, but I'll, I'll do my quick overview of just kind of how we're tackling these pieces again. Um, the overall idea that we're looking at key pieces of worship, key pieces of the liturgy, trying to understand what those are in terms of, you know, telling the story for all of us, telling the story of Jesus, telling the story of Jesus' work that he's done in our lives, and that when, when we're in worship each week, these different pieces are kind of reenacting a part of that story, the part, part of what God has done for us, a part of where, what our relationship is with uh, God in terms of being reconciled by Jesus, um, all those kinds of things. So, you know, we're examining those key pieces of worship. Um, when I talk about worship telling the story, you know, these kind of key components, again, God's worth brings forth life, our fall into sin, that Jesus has come to sa save us. He gives us his faith and he's long walking with us, sustaining us as we live, we live the life of faith that he's called us to live. Um, so, so this week uh, with uh, the pieces of worship that we've been looking at, um, this week we're going to be looking at the word of God and the sermon. And I, I still like this idea of, of, of a key word as we think about this in terms of liturgical behaviors, things that are happening with this. Um, and so the, the word this week is proclamation. Um, you've got the proclamation of, of God's word in, in, the, in the, or, the worship service. You've got the proclamation, you know, both in the sense of actually reading God's word, but then also understanding that the sermon itself is a proclamation of God's word as interpreted, as expressed, you know, by the power of the Holy Spirit through the preacher. Um, and so again, we're going to look at this in, in three, three ways. Proclamation is uh, part of God's story for us. Proclamation in worship, uh, what that looks like in terms of the readings of God's word and the sermon itself. But then to, to pivot into that idea of what does that look like for us in our Monday through Saturday lives, our daily lives that we're out living in the world uh, with the opportunities, the options for, for proclaiming the word of God, proclaiming the good news of the gospel proclaiming what God's God has told us in his this story of, of who he is. So proclamation is part of God's story. I mean, it's all over the place. I mean, fundamentally, you're, you're talking about the fact that um, all of Scripture is God-breathed. All of Scripture is there for us, there to reveal, us, reveal to us about who God is, about who Jesus is, about what our nature is to him, how, how we are in, in sin and in need of, of, of his mercy, of his forgiveness. Um, but just a few quick examples that I've got up here on the screen of ways that we can look about um, or look and see proclamation of the good news of Jesus, the proclamation of who God is in the midst of even in, in. so Genesis 3, and this is, this is one that I think about a lot because this is right after the fall. This is when God is talking to the serpent um uh and you're talking verses 14 and 15 is what i picked out but in this this is this is right after what have you done all these different things and and god's you know proclaiming the curse on the serpent but also already here pro demonstrating the promise of jesus coming um, because you have done this cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the fields on your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life i will put enmity enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring but he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel already pointing to Jesus there, meaning the he that getting spoken of here, um, already recognizing that Christ is going to be coming right after the fall. I don't have this one on the screen here, but Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Again, just speaking about the fact that all through the Old Testament, all through the prophets, God's speaking to those people. And, and then obviously what we have in the New Testament, what we have in the Gospels, the continued reality that God is speaking to us through his word. God's speaking to us to tell us who he is, to tell us, again, the nature of where we are and what Jesus has done for us. Uh, John 1, <clears throat> one that I think that we know well. But this points, again, just the idea that everything we know about God's word points to Jesus. In fact, even John saying that the word of God, in fact, is Jesus here. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word is with God. He was in, <clears throat> in the beginning with God, God. All things were made through him, and without him, not anything was made that was made. In him was life, and the light of life was, uh, the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming to the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. 
He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But all, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood or the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And again, all that's just encompassing Jesus right there. Jesus that was there before that anything was made. Jesus was there to make sure that everything that was made that was made. Jesus was that it was always there getting pointed to through everything that God's word says about the promises of the covenant with the people of Israel all the way through the, you know, the recognizing that the Messiah was to come to save. And here at this point, John's again, tying it back to creation, tying it to the promises that were made to the people in the Old Testament. And then he comes into the world to save us, which is the ultimate piece about God's story. Um, Isaiah 53 um, is another one of my favorites, just because of how much it points to the crucifixion, how much it points to the fact that it's, it's God's will that his son would be pierced for our transgressions, that it's God's will that he's willing to give up his son to sacrifice his son for our sake. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I've got it all here. Um, it's long, but I want to get us into discussion on worship and some other things. But it's one of my favorite, I don't know, I've got lots of different favorites, I suppose. But <laughs> it's really good in the sense of how much it is exactly very easy to read and very easy to understand how it's pointed to exactly what Jesus, who Jesus is and what Jesus is coming to do to die on the cross. Um, one more just on proclamation, again, in, in lots of different choices we could have picked, or I could have picked, I guess, to look at this, but this idea of proclamation and God's story for us is just Luke 2, and this is the, the moment when the angels come to the shepherds to tell them about um, that Jesus was born. Again, proclaiming the good news, the good news of that Jesus was born, coming into the world to save us. <clears throat> and here it is again. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you the good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you this is born this day in the city of David, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Um, suddenly there was the, with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest and on peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to, over to Bethlehem to see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And then afterwards, to skip forward a few verses, but the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard, and it has been told of them. But again, just a palpable example of, you know, it even uses the, I bring the good news and the great joy that will be for all people. Good news, the great joy that is Jesus. So proclamation of Jesus as part of God's story for us. Um, thoughts, comments, ideas, anything from anybody before we dive into worship? Stu? I, I, I'm sure I've read this that way before, but it's interesting to me in that area. That it's, so convinced it's going to happen as we talk about it with the Yeah. yeah. That, it's, that it's written, what, probably six or eight hundred years before the yeah. birth of Christ, and it's a done thing. As you were talking about the Genesis passage, I think we mentioned last, last week something about the <clears throat> Egyptian's passion of Christ. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite scenes in that, in that film, and I don't remember if it was in connection with Temptation, or I think it was at Gethsemane, and this is totally non-biblical. But it's an artistic addition. As Jesus, was at Gethsemane, after he stands up from his prayer to the Father, he turns around and there's a serpent laying there and he stomps on his head. Mm -hmm. and, oh, that just, that just did, you know. Well, in and the, if in, you don't know Genesis 3, that means absolutely nothing. Well, in, in the mood of the sentiment of good that's going on there, the way they did that, again, the artistic interpretation, because this is the prayer of, you know, Father, can this cup be taken from you, but not my will, but your will be done. And it made, made clear at that point that he's going to go to the cross. Yep. And, it yep. turned, and turns around, and, it's, and it just it has this feeling of darkness, this feel of the, the shroud of the sin that's being laid upon him, and, yeah, stomps yep. on it. Other thoughts, comments about proclamation and God's story for us, where we can we can move into talking about worship a little bit. All right. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, 
I, I like the Old Testament readings on, on, on this because uh, currently I am reading Isaiah at home, Book of Isaiah, and, and doing a study on that. And Isaiah's got four servant songs mm -hmm. on, you know, on, on Jesus' death, actually, mm -hmm. you know, on the crucifixion. So, like, like you said, it, it, Isaiah didn't miss words. It, I mean, it was there constantly yep. in his. He's called the evangelist of the Old Testament. And there's even pieces there that are in there too that are talking about the incarnation, talk about Jesus' birth. You know, um, I don't remember the exact spots. Isaiah seven, I believe, and a couple Nine other spots. Seven. Yep. Nine yep. So, so pro proclamation and worship. Um, I've got a few notes up here, um, and I think you know part of this. Part of this for me is I was, is I was preparing, kind of looking at this, and and this this gets into the you know, how we as Lutherans think about the word of God and thinking about it in the sense that it's the, the sole rule, well, rule and norm for our faith and the fact that we believe it actually is God's word, that these people wrote these things inspired by the Holy Spirit, that God was given the actual words. These aren't things that we're just, you know, looking at to hear and think that, that it's got some sort of rational interpretation that we can get from it or some sort of idea that these are good good things for us to understand in life, but we really got to then, you know, put our own selves into it. But when we hear this in worship, you know, and we say, you know, <clears throat> this is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. We're saying that this is, actually, this is actually God's words. And because of that, when you think about it in terms of what that means for how we hear it, that it's actually God speaking to us right in this moment. Yes, there's historical context if you're looking at um, something like the, the fig tree parable today and why Jesus told that parable to the folks that he was in. And maybe you can understand that parable or understanding the, you know, Pastor Will's preaching on uh, the epistle this week and understanding the historical context to what was going on in the church of Corinth and why that those things might get said to those points. But, but the reality also that when we're in worship or when you're reading God's word, that it's very much directly God speaking to us right now in this moment, giving us an understanding, giving us a context for what are, what it means that as we're living our lives in this story. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I, I, I've often heard this, so, and, and I probably know what we're saying, but why do we just stand for the gospel? Why do we stand for all these? I mean, they're God's word, mm -hmm. right? Inspired. And I understand that, you know, the gospel that is, you know, the gospel is the gospel, but should we stand for all of these? Yeah, I mean, it's, in my mind, it's it's a distinction without a difference. You know, it, it, and so it's just become a tradition of, well, we do this because we're honoring Jesus. Yeah, right. And right. it gets to the, we, we talked last week <clears throat> some about sacrificial versus sacramental aspects of worship and the standing for us is a sacrificial thing, way that we're offering praise and honor and glory to Jesus because we stand up for, you know, sometimes people kneel if you have kneelers in a service or different things like that. And so these are behavioral postures, things we do as, as we're enacting the story in worship. But in terms of, <clears throat> the efficacy of God's word, the reality that God's word is a two-edged sword that speaks to us. Isaiah, or um, we, we read from Ezekiel at eight o'clock this morning, Ezekiel speaks just as much in the sense of, of it being the word of God about who Jesus is, sometimes in more oblique, less direct ways than the gospel would, but it's still God's word. Right. I, I just always wondered that. I didn't yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Isn't the gospel reading is supposed to be the highlight of the service yes <laughs> yep so that would might be distinguished from the other <laughs> and part of it most gospel accounts not all of them include the very words of christ and so i use them not a, i usually preface it with out of love and respect for the savior who speaks so in his word to us so it's a special recognition of i can't think of a second well, and that probably more than anything else. I know. Well, it's kind of like tradition. So yeah, it's a tradition that we've become accustomed to, and it's what we do. Um, but it certainly is a matter of of there's nothing. Use the fancy word for it is adiaphora. There's nothing commanding or forbidding it in terms of what God's word says about how you should do it. It's just something we've done over time that is intended to give honor and glory to Christ. Which and, and that we offer. Because <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I
so when we're hearing these, you know, words we've got in the in the in the services, you know, obviously we've got three three readings each week, and and part of this is that <clears throat> ultimately looking at that how did, how do these words that we're hearing point to Jesus, you know, point to point us to the fact that only through Jesus, only through God's Son, we're able to know the Father, know know His favor, know His grace, know who He is. Um, <clears throat> To this point, I've got, a, I've got a, a brief quote from Luther here about Old Testament readings. The reclamation from the reading of the Old Testament reminds us of Luther's strong commitment to this testament and his exhort, exhort, exhortation to us to find Christ in its books. I mean, even downstairs with what Pastor Will's doing with the readings, you know, praying through the Psalms and how much that's an integral piece about it, that you're looking at, you know, Psalm 22 is an easy one, which is where you get the... Um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All those kinds of things. It's easy to see when Christ says that later on the cross that this is really about Christ. But when you're reading the Psalms, it's first and foremost about Jesus. Jesus expressing these words in terms of the way that he's drawing back to God, the way that he's singing back to God, of recognizing the relationship that he has with his Father. And then it's secondarily about us. So <clears throat> the epistle re reading, again, recalls the early Christ Christian tradition of reading from the memoirs of the apostles. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, if you see this, how often we, we get through this. And, um, but the whole idea that lots of times when you're going through the epistle readings in our, in our lectionaries, it's called, or the pericope is the fancy word for it. But this whole idea that um, we're walking through it in lecto continua, which really just means continuous reading. Oftentimes there's spots. Um, one example um, I've got in here um, for a series of Sundays, especially during Pentecost, you know, when we're going through Pentecost, you get the epistle come from the same book. Um, and I think even if, trying to remember, I, I'm trying to remember what comes up. We're in, we're in series C right now. We use the three year series, um, but there's examples where, you know, you might go through the book of Romans over a series of 10 or 12 weeks and you're doing almost all of Romans through that. Or I know that there's another section where you go through almost all of first Corinthians. Um, and, and again, it's just meant to help us tie together the fact that we're reading these books together as you go through these different readings. Um, gospel reading, Luther just spoke of the importance of recognizing the presence of Christ in the gospel, for preaching the gospel is nothing else than Christ coming to us, so we're being brought to him. So, I want to dive into sermons here specifically in a second, but any thoughts about the, the three readings or just the whole notion of God speaking to us in the in the word as it gets read? Yeah. Stripping the canopy to crack this question, but you said we're in C right now. Yep. It's not like you look in front of the hymn book where it lists all that stuff. So I wonder... Is that up to the pastor, the individual congregation, or what series they use? Or is it like the synod suggesting you use a series? No, it's it's completely up to the individual congregation how they want to do it. Um, both from the standpoint of, so there's a three-year series where you go through it. It's spread out over a longer period of time. There's a one-year series where you go through the same readings every year, basically. And then even to have the flexibility, and we've done this here sometimes, you know, the most recent example would have been when we did the stewardship series in the fall, where we actually move away from the selected readings to pick our own for the things that fit the sermon series that you might be doing or the Bible study series. So there's nothing, nothing to do with the synod, I said. You no, know, the, the synod basically puts, to get, put, puts together, it's been, for the most part, the one-year series has definitely been around since the Reformation. The three-year series, I'm trying to think time frame wise I know I studied this a little bit. I don't remember the exact time frame, but they've been around for a long time. Yeah. And so they're just there as resources for us to, to help that we're looking at the same things and telling this, you know, the, the first half of the church year tells the story of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's basically Advent through um, Easter into Pentecost. And then Pentecost, obviously, through the end of the church year is telling the story of the church. So that's kind of how it's set up in terms of the, the two halves of the church here. First half is the story about Jesus. The second half is the story about Jesus working in the church. Yeah, I was, I was just curious as how much input the student has in um, uh, organizing the church here, so to speak. I mean, they, they have in the sense of, of laying it out kind of the way that it is laid out. Again, the two halves of the church here, the things that the, the readings are going to focus on. But... Other than that, in terms of saying, here's some really good resources for you, they give individual congregations a lot of autonomy in terms of how you're going to set up your actual services. Um, and I'll, I'll get to a point here in a second about talking about the sermon. Um, when you really, when we're going to talk about marks of the church here in a second. Did you have a thought? You're going to say something? Well, I, was just, 
a lot of people think the Senate controls. The Senate has absolutely no control. Congregations are autonomous, except in the fact that as a member of the Missouri Senate, Faith Lutheran Church agrees to abide by certain doctrines. If we vary from those doctrines, then the Senate has a, has a voice. But if we if we don't, I mean, in terms of how pastor, who's, who's being called as a pastor, what style of worship, what, you know, if you're going to use the lectionary series, a lot of churches anymore are using whatever, the, instead of using the lectionary series, they use a sermon series. They'll pick a book of the Bible and work their way through it over period of time, you know, just that that's congregational autonomy. That explains why King of Kings and Omaha is so different. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I know there's a classmate of mine, they're up in Michigan, and that seems like that's much more what they're doing is they're just constantly doing series after series after series. And um maybe it's been mischaracterized to me, but it doesn't sound like they're using the lectionary readings very much at all. You know, again, they have the flexibility to do that. Maybe that really works for what they need in that context for what the people need to hear. Um, I think it's kind of neat that we have that flexibility. Like, we own this building. Yep. Right. And I don't, not sure if like Grace Lutheran, all they own their own building. I, like, I think ELCA, they, the Citadel owns everything. It, it seems to me, at least, that, you know, and this would be a rabbit hole, but even in the call process, the Synod or the ELCA, and certainly Catholic Church, it's much more. Rather than here's the, you know, we just issued a divine call downstairs for a music teacher. Here's the music teacher we'd like to have. Where instead, I think it works the other way around of here's the music teacher you're going to get. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's so all on that same line. I think that that happens much more that way. I know the Methodists uh, put the sign pastor and music teachers. Mm -hmm. Do you have a comment too? Yeah, well, maybe you already talked about this for some of this. Um, why do we have three meetings? Where does that come from? I've always wondered that because I've gone to other churches, mm -hmm. not group of churches, and they don't do that. I haven't gone to Catholic, so I can't really say but, you know, evangelical churches. They don't have three meetings. Where does that come from? I think, I mean, is that tradition again, or does it come from the Catholic Church? I mean, if, if you're talking about it, it's, it's going to go back to the very early church, I believe. You're talking about things that have been happening since probably the second, third century in terms of the way that this is getting done. It's been like that for <clears throat> it's been like that for a really, really long time. And part of it again, you know, the quote from Luther there of saying, How can you find Christ in the Old Testament? Because everything about the Old Testament in some way or another is either the story about God's people or the story about God's promises to those people that he's going to be bringing Jesus. And then in some ways, the entirety of the New Testament, I've thought about it this way, the entirety of the New Testament is really just a commentary on the Old Testament. <coughs> that it's just illuminating the fact of here's how Jesus has come to fulfill those promises made in Isaiah 53, or those, those promises made in the garden that Jesus is going to come as the Messiah to save the world. And so whether you look at the Gospels then, specifically that they are actually Jesus' words, you know, I mean, there's a few other spots that have Jesus' words directly, but not very many. Um, so then you've got the spot to tell the story of Jesus fulfilling the Old Testament, and then the epistles then being a way that partly fulfilling Jesus, what um, Jesus has come to do, but also then seeing the work of the early church and understanding what for that what that means, like what that looks like for us and applying it for ourselves as the body of believers, as the body of Christ, as we live in the knowledge of Jesus coming to fulfill all those promises. Well, uh, it's 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 good stuff. I mean, I wonder how that evolved because I've sat in secretarial meetings. Mm -hmm. They didn't do that. And one of the things I liked about this church when I came back back to the church mm -hmm. was that we had three meetings that they were Old Testament epistles. Like, oh, well, I really like that, but you don't see that in the church, not regularly. And so I I, don't, I just wonder if it's unique for the Lutherans. Did it come from the Catholic Church? It's just, that's yep. just me, and so maybe I just need to look at history of that. Our roots are out of the Roman Catholic right. tradition. Right. Yeah. And so we, you look at most what are called liturgical churches. And into that, I would put Roman Catholic, Lutheran, the Orthodox churches, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, you know, uh, those liturgical, they almost all use three lessons. Oh, okay. Um, you know, and it usually follows, and, and actually, the, the lectionary, what are called the lectionary series, 
that we used is very similar to the one for Old Catholic Church. Because I found it interesting early in my ministry I was talking to a pastor of an Assembly of God church. And I said something about the, the lesson appointed for this coming Sunday. He said, what do you mean appointed? And I showed him the lectionary series. He goes, where did you get that? I said, well, we've always used that. He says, my, I, that's just marvelous. He says, you don't have to pick lessons every week? I said, no, they're very few. Oh, my gosh. You know. I said, it's been, it's been around for hundreds of years. Yeah, and, and the other thing that he made, he made that commented was, and I found this not, not insightful on his part, but, but also very helpful in understanding the purpose of the lectionary series. He says, in other words, I don't, if, if I were to follow that series, it would keep me from preaching the same thing over and over and over again. He says, you know, it's, it's so easy when you're, when you're choosing the lessons to climb on your little hobby horse and beat the congregation week after week after week with the same message. He said, you know, this lays it all out. And I says, yeah, you know, from the, the, the festival half of the year, the whole story of Jesus from birth to, to resurrection. Uh, and really his return. And then the Pentecost season, laying out all the all the doctrines and uh, uh, what I call, you know, the Old Testament promise, the Gospels are fulfillment, and the rest of the New Testament is application. Mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, so, yeah, he was just, he, he said, never heard of that before. Yeah, I said, well, here's a copy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. And if you're a big organization to ours, as it is. It doesn't seem to be the Southern Church. Church. That's fabulous. Yeah. You know, they're, they're okay, but um, that's one of the things I like about this church. And of course, I grew up in the Lutheran Church, and so I just grew up with it, but I didn't realize that they didn't do that. Yeah. So you go and sit in front of the church, and you realize they don't do that. If you're ever curious about like the lectionary series, go to, go to the Synodical website, lcms.org. Yeah. There's a whole thing on worship. And you can find the lectionary series. So if you want to know what the lessons are yep. for next week. And they, they've got the one year, they've got the three year, they've got the series A, series B, series C. The other thing I... And there are probably actually, I, I have a book. Used to have, I don't think I've got it anymore. Used to have a book in my library. Uh, Nestle's lectionary series. There are probably 150 or 200 different lectionary series that they've developed over the years. Yep. Um, one of the things I... Use one of, one, two, one of the things I think is really neat is we're talking about the lectionary series and you know the, the notion of how it helps you preach on different things or how to set up you know to tie into jumping into sermons here a little bit but is the is the reality of the recognition that <clears throat> it's the Holy Spirit working through the church and the recognition <laughs> that you know whatever assigned readings may be for that Sunday <clears throat> then you know at least in our context for Pastor Will for myself might put you in a spot to look at something different, to look at a text maybe you haven't looked at in a while, to look at it within the context of what we are here here at faith. What do the, the people need to hear? But fundamentally, first and foremost, to, to recognize that the sermon itself is the Holy Spirit working through a pastor to speak God's word to the people and to speak God's word to the people in, in just the same way, not just the same way, but in a way that's just as efficacious, the way that's just as important, the, the, the way that has just as much certainty as just getting done reading the gospel or reading the old testament or reading the new te the new uh, the epistle reading and that it, that it's that it's god speaking through that man in that spot to give the church his word to give his church you know the proclamation of christ to give his church the proclamation of the good news of the gospel for those hearers to hear and be reminded about who jesus is and i mean you know i've got this note here that lutherans are people of the word you know we talk about that obviously a lot but in contrast to some of the denominations where the word refers only to scripture, Lutherans also understand the word <clears throat> as the proclamation of the law and gospel. So you've, you've got the proclamation then when the, when the pastor's up there in the pulpit. The proclamation of God's love in Christ for the whole world is the high point of the service of the word. So you said gospel, I mean, the gospel is leading up to it, right to it. But really, we look at the, the, the sermon itself as being the high point of the service of the word. Um, which also comes in the gospel too. So yes, you're talking about all these things, but during the sermon, the living voice of the gospel is delivered for the continuing life of the gathered guests. And this prepares worshipers for scattering into the world for the remainder of the week. 
Through the sermon, we come to a better understanding of ourselves, especially for our need for God's forgiveness, but we also come face to face with God's mercy and love. Week after week, God's faithful hear the voice of their good shepherd preparing them in a sense for that final day when Jesus calls them into the eternal reward. So you've got proclamation there in the sermon every single week, you know, again, retelling that story of Jesus, where we stand in relationship with God, what Jesus has done for us, you know, a reminder that we're justified before God by God, by Jesus' grace and mercy, what he's done with the cross and the empty tomb, but then also the, the encouragement, the, the push, the gospel imperative, whatever you want to call it, that, that is, we're living in the, in the sense of the Great Commission, called to go out and share that good news to other people, called to go out and um, proclaim the good news of who Jesus is to the people we see in our day to day lives. I'm going to go to day to day lives here in just a second, but I mean, a few other, <clears throat> one other, um, I think it's one other, it's two other things. When we're talking about proclamation and worship, I mentioned this briefly, but um, the importance of preaching Christ. Uh, marks of the church, when we're really talking about marks of the church, we're talking about word and sacrament. You know, we're, we're talking about, as Lutherans, we talk about word and sacrament mean the means of grace, the, the spots where we're sure and certain that the Holy Spirit shows up to give us the very truth of what Jesus is, to give us his very body and blood, to give us forgiveness of sins and faith in baptism through the water and the word, all those different things. But um, the importance of preaching Christ, being a mark of the church, um, this comes out of our large catechism. For where Christ is not preached, there is no Holy Spirit to create, call, and gather the Christian church, apart from which no one can come to the Lord Christ. If you're not up there preaching who Jesus is, might as well not even be the church at all. You aren't the church, frankly. If you're not up there talking about Jesus, you're somehow denying who Jesus is, denying that he's true man, true God, here to save us. <clears throat> Augsburg Confession. This is, again, just comes out of our confessions. It also taught that at all times there must be and remain one holy Christian church is the symbol of all believers among whom the gospel is purely preached and the holy sacraments are administered according to the gospel. Again, from the Augsburg Confession, a different spot. So that we may obtain this faith, the ministry of teaching the gospel administering the sacraments was instituted. For through the word and sacraments as through instruments the Holy Spirit is given, who affects faith where and when it pleases God and those who hear the gospel. That is to say, in those who hear that God, not on account of our own merits, but on account of Christ, justifies those who believe that they are received into grace on account of Christ. So again, just that recognition that in this sense of proclamation, in this sense of preaching, the Holy Spirit's at work. And those that hear Jesus' words, those that hear that call of repentance, that call of love, that call of that Christ has done for us, he's going to effectuate faith in their hearts, effect, effectuate faith, you know, the, the sustaining of faith for those of us that already believe the Holy Spirit's active living in the church through the proclamation of the gospel. <clears throat> and then the second point here, just the word of God is the sole norm and rule of faith. Um, maybe this is something we've heard many times as Lutherans that we believe, but um, we believe, teach, and confess that the only rule and norm according to which all teachings together with all teachers should be evaluated and judged. Are the prof <clears throat> so this should be judged that are the prophetic and apostolic scriptures of the Old New Testament alone, for it is written in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. St. Paul is written, even if we or an angel of heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. So again, just whether it's Pastor Will and myself up there in the pulpit, whether it's a church that you visit, whether whatever it happens to be, the judge that you're looking at is, are you hearing about Jesus Christ? Are you hearing about the truth about who he is, what that means for us? And then are the teachings of the church resting solely and surely on God's word? Because God's word speaks to us again now, even in, in these moments of our day-to-day -day lives, it just as much as it spoke in different ways that it spoke to the early Christian church or to the people of Israel all these different times of, of things we can look back to. Comments, thoughts about any of that? All right. Well, I'm curious to, to jump on this and, and, and we keep doing this because I only got 45 minutes and I try to pack too much in, but so we've got nine minutes, eight minutes maybe. Um, proclamation in our daily lives and, and really, we've got the responsibility to share the good news. We've got the responsibility to be ready to share the good news, to talk about who Jesus is, to go forth into the world. Um, Mark 16 and Matthew 28, both are, you know, those two gospel writers accounts of the great commission. 
um, Mark 16 is, you know, this is Jesus. And he said to them, go into the, all the world and proclaim the gospel of the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Uh, Matthew 28, I started at verses 18. This is 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So you've got right out of Jesus' mouth there, the notion that he's pushing all of us as his disciples, as people who have faith in him, who understand who he is, to go and tell other people about Jesus. Um, the other one I've got up here in terms of this responsibility, this comes from 1 Peter 3, and this is one I think about a lot, just in the standpoint of if you're walking, you know, in your day-to-day -day life, Monday through Saturday, you know, not in worship on a Sunday morning, it could be with a coworker, it could be with a neighbor, it could be with a family member, it could be with a friend, whoever it happens to be. But <clears throat> this is First Peter 3, 14 to 17. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you'll be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Yeah, do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, that it should be God's will, than for doing evil. But that note, and there, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason about the hope that is in you. And so, I guess in the in the in the few minutes we have left, I'm I'm curious, who's who wants to share, who wants to talk about what it looks like for God's story of proclamation, how it shows up in your life. Those moments maybe when you didn't expect it <clears throat> and God puts you in a spot where you have to make a defense for the faith and the hope that you have. Or those moments maybe where maybe it was more intentional and you had a spot where you could really share about the good news of who Jesus is, knowing that when you're proclaiming the good news of Jesus, you're proclaiming the word of God. You're proclaiming the, the, the word of God, meaning that tying it in the fact that Jesus is the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking how your testimony. Yeah. That's watching and our responsibility to uh, bring people into the world. And if they're totally out of hands, you know, much stronger than anything else. The gospel. Yep. It's the same thing, really. And you're talking about Ezekiel today, where it's yeah, basically saying. Yeah. If you look at somebody and see that they're sinning, yeah. I mean, I'm paraphrasing it, and you don't call them out on it, you don't, you don't help them see the error of their ways. Yeah. Yeah. It's very appropriate for responsibility for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Stu. What do you say about the group that's called Kennedy? Mm-hmm. Went through training to do a gospel presentation to people where we have to we have to organize around who we call just people that have visited in the church or had some other connection. We always had a reason to go to the same house. Just thinking over the years how <clears throat> we as people have changed from welcoming visitors into our home to now the sign no solicitors beware dog yeah. type thing of yeah and so those opportunities to present the gospel in one manner or another have to morph into something that's maybe uh, done more on the basis of relationships as opposed to random the relation, relation, relational is the exact word I was thinking of. You're talking, Bob. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was. I think that's always been the case, though. Is that the most effective <clears throat> witness that we can offer is from within a pre-existing relationship? Um, funny thing. Friday night we had a neighbor come over. Long story short, uh, we had to, I talked over some business with him. But he and his wife are, are expecting their first child. And my wife and I have had a concern. They both grew up in the Roman Catholic Church, um, but are not practicing. And we just told Greg, you know, not not for the baby's sake, but for your own sake, you really need to get back to church. And, you know, if that's the Roman Catholic Church, that's fine. But if you want to come to church with us, you're more than welcome. And, uh, but I thought, you know, that, that's, 
if the, if that relationship had not been there, we would not have addressed that issue. No. But we know him well enough, and, and uh, that, that we were comfortable. And I think we, he knew us well enough to know that that was that was coming from. A, well, we told him, you know, your baby's going to have three sets of grandparents. <laughs> Because yeah. we're across the street, we're closer than the other two. <laughs> um, I think one of the things for me, you know, as I put all of you on the spot to talk about proclamation and, and how it shows up in your lives, is that <clears throat> I'll, I'll be honest about when I was younger that how many times that I sort of walked into it when I thought about opportunities for evangelism or discipleship, which everyone could call this, they're not the same thing, but really we're talking evangelism here, speaking to people that are unbelievers, people that, that don't know who Jesus is. You know how many moments you have those opportunities in your life but I, I would walk into it like i need to have this developed apologetic ar argument about why i'm right and to be able to refute kind of point by point of explaining our doctrine explaining who jesus is or and some of this is just the way i'm wired but some of this was i was just young maybe and dumb um and like to think as i've gotten wiser older yeah i'll, I'll come to you a second but yeah yeah I think you like the signs, you know, you put a faith in your sign in your in your in your um, God font. You can put up a little flag that has a cross on it or something. Mm -hmm. And people know where you're gonna come from when you start talking to them. Um as as because I've been able to do that with both of my neighbors that I've learned, you know, different things. But also when you're in business, uh, when I was working. At the bottom of my signature, I could put something. I put like Coram Deo, mm -hmm. and people would ask me what that meant. So it would it would open up a conversation. Then, so today I think you have to be sneaky about it because yeah. people don't want you to come up to them and start talking <coughs> about your religion. But they do want to talk about it. They just don't want you to come and, and preach it to them. Yeah, or 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 seeming like you are preaching, depending on how yeah. you how you, what you share and. For me, the thing that I've, you know, I'm talking over the last, you know, 25 years or whatever it would be, you know, from younger and I could tell you sometime when I have more time about the Mormons coming to my door and then encourage them to come back a couple more times and sit and argue with them about, you know, doctrine and things like that. But that's something I would have done when I was younger. But for me, much more so now, like even, you know, Tiffany and I were at a St. Patrick's Day, you know, get together on Friday evening, you know, similar kind of thing. And throughout the course of the conversation in the evening, eventually we started talking about sermons a little bit. We were talking about Jesus and a variety of things about how it fit together and and in my mind then when i think about proclamation in, in my day-to-day -day life i just think about the parable of the sower but i'm out there sowing seed and what moments then does god present those opportunities where you could talk a little bit about jesus or you can even talk about jesus sneaky way you know yeah, maybe maybe it seems you know <laughs> but but in a, in a way that, that doesn't seem so offensive to someone maybe that isn't ready to hear the full throatedness of the gospel, or even maybe you're offering the full throatedness of the gospel, but again, in a relational way that helps them to kind of start seeing it. But then, and what I mean by the parable of the sower and sowing the seed is that share a little bit about it. And I don't know what happens for this person I was talking to Friday night, a couple of people I was talking to Friday night. I don't know what God's going to do with that, but trusting that it's the Holy Spirit's working in their heart, He can do whatever He wants with, with it. If it leads to more conversations with that person and me in particular at some point, then that's great. If it leads to them coming to the church, if it leads to whatever it happens to be, but just recognizing that in that moment, God gave me a chance to talk about Jesus for 20 minutes and that you're sowing seed as you go. The coolest on the practical note. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you have preached sermons, have a really good joke. I'm serious. <laughs> I know you are. I mean, I don't make it so good that everybody forgets everything else, but you'd be surprised. At, I mean, not surprised. When I was working and I was, had a lot more contact with people, like no one went church, the way to get the thought of God in their heads was, boy, you should have heard that joke Pastor Dan told in the <laughs> sermon. And I'll tell him the story. That lets them know I'm a Christian, that I'm a church member. And sometimes, well, what church do you belong to? Yep. You need to get a conversation going. But I mean, talk about a non threatening introduction to the subject of. Well, religion. And not just that, but it also sticks in people's minds. Yeah. I mean, I remember once I preached for a pastor's installation and after the service, the district president came and said, Bob, I think that I think I like that sermon this time better than the first time you preached it. 
And I looked at him and said, what made you think you could uh, preach that sermon for? He says, I remember the illustration. I remember the story you told. I said, same story, different sermon. He said, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> About 20 minutes later, I went up to him for the and said, Gene, same sermon. Yeah. <laughs> but it told me something. People remember stories. They remember illustrations. They don't remember the content of the sermon. So how is, how is a story, a non-Christian story, different than a Christian story? I don't know that the story has to be necessarily Christian. Yeah. Because, no, I I think, yeah, no. because I think people in their minds, they're going to remember the story. And then, you know, if they've been paying attention at all, they're going to remember the connection yeah. that you make or the pastor. I mean, whoever it may be. Well, and how often do we use stories in our lives to help find meaning about who we are? Sure. You know, stories about how I remember my grandparents and my grandma making fried chicken and smoking a cigarette while she's making fried chicken as I'm a little kid and whatever kind of stories I've got in my head that help, you know, then remember about who she is and connections that I make for what memories are that we do the same kind of thing with all different kinds of stories. And again, the, the aspect of taking that story to find meaning in it but then also connected it back to the overall story of who Jesus is. And the story may not have anything directly related to religion, Jesus, church, any of that. It can so, just be so you know, similar to Jesus' parables. Right. Yeah. It was a non biblical right. whatever type of thing that he said in those papers. Or is that the whale that or Wednesday? The whale oh, that the whale, whale the whale that exploded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One question, Dan. Yes. On proclamation, we've been talking a lot about proclaiming to a potential or not a believer. And we also proclaim to each other as Christians and stuff. To, to me, that. <clears throat> it feels sometimes like we're not necessarily comfortable doing that either. Yeah. Because we don't practice it, it as much. And in, in, in some ways, in a very, very simple level, that to me would be a distinction between evangelism and discipleship. Evangelism would be, I'm talking to the unbeliever that doesn't know about Jesus. Discipleship would mean, oh, Stu, you're having a really rough week. <clears throat> I'm here to remind you about who Jesus is, to remind you of the faith that you have, remind you that he's walking along with you, to remind you, you know, to help build you up as a fellow brother in Christ in that moment that you're, that you're struggling and you need to hear the, or, or even to the point of, you know, the idea that someone's walking away and walking outside of how God should be walking them, part of discipleship could also be you're living in a way that you shouldn't be living, come, repent and come back to how Christ is calling you to live. You know, either building up in the, you know, building up in the gospel when you're beating yourself up and you're having a hard time or confronting with the law when necessary, if someone's walking in a way they shouldn't be walking. It may be me, but I just, I'm not sure that the Bible says as much as... Are we, are we, just well, but, you know, we're, all, we're also... A bunch of good German Lutherans who don't like to ask for help very often, and sometimes, you know, are, are Nebraska nice about how we. Eh. It's, and it's not it's not a bad thing. It's just you know we don't necessarily open up and, and get to that degree of vulnerability either with each other all the time. Any other final thoughts for comments or questions for the day? All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for those on, on Zoom. We'll see you, see you next week.